I'm Matt Brabham, and this is The Skinny. From the Batheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Welcome to The Skinny. Ken Stout here and Michael Young sitting alongside the track dude back in here. Rico, from what we understand or what I understand, apparently he's taking a nap. Rough weekend? A rough weekend. He's sleeping right now. So we yeah, thought think- we'd give him a little break. Uh, we had a little bit of issue with one of the airlines, so we thought we'd give him a break and let him take a nap. <laughs> yes. And, and apparently that weather issue that they had, they were the only airline that had it. It was a crazy weather predicament down in Florida. <laughs> Just clouds everywhere. <laughs> Scary. Pretty wild. He was in Dallas, though, right? NHRA yeah. event. So uh, the weather there, too. There's weather yeah. everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Weather happens so. everywhere. So Rico not with us here today, and that's okay. We'll get Michael to fill in. And sitting alongside is one of the young guns that's been paying his dues throughout his career, and it's going to step back and pay him again. You keep scratching until you finally get there, but he was born into a racing family. He has no choice other than to race, and that's a good thing because ex- he's extremely good at it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matty Brabham. Matthew Brabham, we know him as Matty Brabham or Matty Brabs, and can find him almost anywhere, but has worked his way up through the ranks. And yes, the same Brabham of Jeff Brabham, the his father, four-time EMSA champ, extremely successful, and his grandfather, Sir Jack Brabham, a three-time Formula One champ. So yeah, the racing pedigree is in there a little bit. And we don't want to forget about mom, because mom is also a jet ski champ. So you have no choice, dude, but to step up and win championships. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a disease. It's a disease that's passed down. I, that's the best way to, I describe it. Um, you know, mom and dad were trying to get me to do everything else other than race. So, so at least you didn't have to explain it to your parents why you want to go racing. Yeah, I mean, they were. I, I, I took a long explanation, though. I mean, I had to really convince them. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. They, oh, really? They did not want me racing whatsoever. Um, I, I had tennis rackets, golf clubs, anything that I wanted other than a steering wheel I was allowed to have. So. <laughs> Well, How your, many times have we yeah, said oh, that, yeah. like, steer your kids towards yeah, golf or yeah. tennis, anything but racing? Yeah. He had all the best equipment in the world and didn't use any of it. What was your first memory of racing? Since, obviously, that is the pedigree of the family. What very first thing do you remember as a kid? I mean, yeah, the first thing I ever remember as a kid was going to my mom's races uh, and jet ski racing because dad was uh, towards the end of his career in uh, supercars in Australia and I was starting to get to the age where I can actually remember because I, I was born in, in the U.S. when Dad was racing here, and then we moved all back to Australia, and he was at the end of his career. So I didn't remember too much about going to Dad's races because I I think I went to like the 500 when I was like a baby and stuff. But I have no memories of it. Um, so I used to go to Mom's jet ski races in Australia, and that was my first kind of memory or earliest I can remember of going to a race and doing the whole weekend and, and getting into it. And so that was kind of my first taste of racing was mom, mom ripping in the jet skis. Was it even a car thing or more jet skis? We were like, man, these jet skis are cool. I would yeah. imagine that was pretty cool what, for a kid. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it, my mom, I was scared of my mom cause she was big too. She had the whole uh, biceps and muscles like from racing the jet skis. I mean, I was almost, were those most, are real jet skis. Like you had to stand on and balance, like, yeah. you know, the ones today you can kind of sit on and just ride like a bike, but old school, you had to really balance. Oh things. yeah. She did a bit of everything. So she did the stand ups, she raced the sit downs and stuff, but the, you know, the sit downs, we have one now that the one that she used to race back then and it, if you hold it flat out and turn it a corner you can't hold, it, you can't hold on like you have to be really strong and so yeah i was more scared of mom like as a kid than i was <laughs> dad but that was my first uh um introduction to racing which is kind of weird because most people think obviously my grandfather and my dad or, or the car racing stuff but i just i love the competitiveness of it whether it was car racing or jet ski racing the atmosphere of being at a race was, was what got me hooked originally for sure was your grandfather finished with his career by the time you were able to to know what's really what's going on yeah yeah i i never went to any races my dad grew up with jack so he went to a lot of the f1 races as a kid um but i think my dad was one of the only ones because he was um the oldest brother of everyone so he went to all the f1 races and has like a good look good stories and memories and stuff but i never went to my grandfather's races and stuff i just heard the stories at the dinner table and that was like enough for me, really, because that was it was pretty wild back then, apparently. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that was. And, and then I went to like I remember one supercar race I went to with my dad and watched, and 
but yeah, most of my memories as a young kid was mom jet ski races. Wow, so not even much uh, involvement with your father's career either. How many brothers, sisters does your father have? Um, so there was three sons of Jack. Okay. So The other two uh, involved in racing? Yeah, so David raced in F1. Um, he was in the, the Senna era of F1, so he, he was like teammates with Ratzenberger when he got killed, and then Senna was killed the following day, I think. Um, and then he obviously won Le Mans as well. And did all the sports car racing stuff. And then um, my other uncle, not so much in racing. And then dad, obviously, heavy in racing, especially in the U.S. as well. So yeah, the, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I just, I'd always, I always point out that he's a four-time EMSA GTP champ. But he actually had, uh, I think, like 12 years in the kart series. So a lot of open wheel experience as well. And then also won Bathurst. Yeah, they, they won together, actually. So dad and, uh, and David won Bathurst together as brothers. So, um that's pretty cool. And then dad uh, won Le Mans, the 24-hour race, and so did David as well. And they both won with Persia. So it's pretty pretty special and cool. You've had a pretty stout career, especially coming up through the Road to Indy program. Marco has mentioned, Graham Rahal has mentioned, so Andretti, Rahal, obviously, huge names in open-wheel racing. <clears throat> when did you realize that you carried the Brabham name, that you were a Brabham? Did that... When did that hit you that it's like, oh, I'm somebody, people are watching me. Why are they watching me? I don't understand why. It, at what point in your career did that start to, to um, come about? Probably when I started racing go-karts in Australia, I started to figure out what was going on. Because as a young kid, I was so naive and young to it all. I was like, I just had no rec like no understanding of what he had done, either what my dad had done either. And so I used to go to the go-kart track and dad would be telling me to do something. And I would look at him like, like, what do you know? Like, you're just my dad, you know? Like, you have that that reaction as a kid Damn with all kids. your parents. <laughs> and so that was my reaction. And then he's like, you realize, like, we've all done this before. And, like, we, we know what we're talking about. And I know what I'm talking about. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. And then once I started doing it myself, then I developed an appreciation, understanding of what they did. Because then I was like, oh, wow, this is pretty difficult. And this is competitive and it's hard and it's it's a lot of work. And it's not easy, right? So then I was like, oh, now. And then I got to an age when I was racing cards too that I started to understand what he had done and everything and all his accomplishments. And then people would obviously come up and say things at the racetrack. And I'm like, how do you know? Like, oh, okay. Like, and it, it all clicked when I first started racing. Yeah. But before then, I was just one of the, another kid in another family. I just thought there were, he was my dad that didn't know anything. And he was my grandfather at, at Christmas. So, yeah. I mean, it was, <laughs> That's wild. It was one of those Isn't deals. Yeah. <laughs> So along those lines with that same question, great question, Michael. Um, when did your dad become fully engaged? Like, okay, so he's in the go-kart. Let's see if the kid has any talent. When did he realize, damn, kid's got some talent here, and when did he lock in and say, okay, I, I've got to really help you out? Yeah, it probably was more when I stepped out of go-karting and started getting into real cars is when he really um, started <clears> – <throat> helping me out with stuff and really getting involved because in go-karting in Australia, I mean, I started racing when I was seven and I, I convinced him cause we, w I had some friends that went to and would go-karting and I went to a race and I watched a race. I was like, I really want to do this. And I think he could tell that I really wanted to do it. So then he finally, we got involved and I, I started racing carts, but um, yeah, he was one of those dads that was like, this is just a hobby and this is fun. Like you're way too young to, to know what's going on and to really think that you're going to be successful or not successful or have talent or not. Like you just don't know at that age because there's kids that are just wild and go-karting and then all of a sudden they get mature and then it, all the talent disappears because they start thinking about real world things or whatever. But in go-karting, it was just a hobby for us and, and fun. So we ran the go-kart out of the back of his of dad's van and we just ran it together as like a family on weekends kind of deal and have fun and not take it too seriously. And we would do the big races and go-karting in Australia, but it wasn't like big, big. And there was, there was kids that I raced against that would race every single weekend. And that was like, that was it like that. They were going to be the go-karting world champion. And it was 100% all in no school, you know, mm, wow. <laughs> big time career, you know, ready yeah. to go. And that's not how we did it at all. It was, very laid back, relaxed. Uh, we went to the big races, but we'd just show up, no testing and, and have fun. And then 
so I never really took it that seriously too. And he didn't take it seriously and it was just a hobby. But then when I started doing well in go-karting and then started looking at doing Formula Ford or getting in a proper race car, then it was like, okay, well, if you're going to do this and take it to that level, you have to be serious and let's start really knuckling down on what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing and working out and getting, uh, you know, your mental focus on that. Cause I was in school and hanging out with my buddies and, sometimes going a weekend, you know, to race go-karts and not really, you know, I just wasn't in, I was involved, but I wasn't like at the level I am now and the level I was at racing. And that's when dad really got involved too. Great stuff here. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back on the other side with more inside information, the skinny, if you will, on Matty Brabs. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Welcome back to the skinny Ken Stout here with the track dude, Michael Young, and sitting alongside is young Matty Brabham trying to find his way in this very brutal sport. Certainly has the talent, has the background, has had the support, but it always comes down to the money. And to recap a little bit of his career, worked his way up through karting, which he uh, he's just told us about, and with the support of his father along the way. But 2012, I believe it was, one F2000 with Andretti. Uh, 13 moved up to Pro Mazda, won that championship. Matter of fact, I, be, I believe beat Spencer Piggott uh, either in 2000s or, or Pro Mazda and a ton of wins in the Pro Mazda series and then upped into Indy Lights with Andretti again. But you and I had had a previous conversation on one of the stadium super truck races. There was tire wars or something going on there in 2014 with that IL run. Yeah, I mean, I, I just had a dream run through the road to Indy and uh... – I came over from Australia and I was just the underdog that no one had really heard of. Obviously, I knew my family and stuff, but uh, yeah, I, I jumped in F2000 with Cape Motorsport, uh, two English brothers. I still work with them today. I was just in their shop earlier um, and we won the championship together. Then I won the championship in Pro Mazda and then went into, into lights. And I just had such a quick acceleration through the road to Indy. You know, most people, by the time they get to Indy lights, have had numerous and you know four or five six years in proper race cars before they get there and that was my third year in f wings and slicks and well that that's worth <laughs> mentioning that the year before in pro mazda 11 wins that year yeah i mean it was it was a crazy year i mean it was two or three races i didn't win everything else was was pretty good so i mean it was just everything clicked um the tires clicked you know we changed from uh good year to to Coopers and then the engine um engineers and everyone I just we just all got along so well like I I still talk to all the all the guys that were on that team and it was just like a a crazy year that one of those years where everything clicks and then the following year in lights I mean I won some races and I was up front I think I was like fourth in the championship but I had a lot of uh, DNFs and different things happen and I, I just wasn't I think if I had had like another year I would have been fine but I just accelerated through the road to Indy so fast. I was it was my third year racing. What got you? <laughs> so. Because I remember the, that time when you started, and everybody was like, "Oh wow, he's he's pretty good." And then it's like, "Oh, he's really good." And when you cruise through the first two rungs of the ladder system, and then you got to the Indy Lights, and it just—I don't want to say it leveled off, but we we didn't see that same type of success. Was it they added horsepower? What what was, caught uh, you off? It was just a different tire. So I remember testing on the Firestone. And it was like, oh, wow, like everything's just how it was. And as I was really quick and and then we went to the Cooper and it just it required like a whole new learning phase. And I'm a lot older and wiser now. Um, and I've done a lot of work with the, all the teams that rode to India over the last couple of years since then. So I've kind of gathered a better understanding as to why I wasn't as quick as I probably thought I was going to be in lights. But uh, I think it was just a combination of everything. Like everything didn't quite click as it did in Mazda. 
there was a different um, tire, so everyone needed different setups and development. And I think I was just uh, a little bit too inexperienced because I had rushed through the road to Indy so quick. You know, so a lot of a lot of the guys I remember racing in lights. You know, came, like one of the guys came over. He nearly won the Formula Two championship, and I think those guys were just a, a little bit more switched on with how to develop and set up a car and, and figure all, all of it out. And and that was my third year in wings and slicks. I'm in a lights car. So I think if I had, you know, been a bit older and moved through the road to Indy slower, I would have been way better prepared for the light stuff. And it's just, I don't know, things happen. You, know, you can't win every year. Like it's pretty tough to go through and win every single year. And even having that slight struggle in lights, I was still like the most winningest driver by percentage until Kirkwood came through. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't too bad, you know. I just I struggled in lights. I didn't win the championship. But to say you're struggling just because you didn't win the championship is probably a good thing. So let me just put this to rest while we have you here. Is it Mazda or Mazda? Because <laughs> we're an American now and we say Mazda. I just wanted to confirm it it's Mazda. Mazda, is yeah. Is it Mazda? Nissan on, on Nissan. Uh, yeah, Nissan. Yeah. That's I, would, the other yeah, I would get Diffy on the phone if I were you and get a little support. Because, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm outnumbered here. <laughs> <laughs> So you so you followed up the your rookie season in lights and, and raced just a couple of races and then what happened? I, I just ran out of money. I I had no budget to run at that level, um, and the only reason I was there it was because I won the championships. And uh, you know, dad helped, and dad helped me a lot with budget, obviously like with go karting and stuff because we were just doing that for fun. And then he was based in Australia and doing a lot of BMW driver training stuff. And because of that, we got a lot of um, support and sponsorship through dad working with people that were involved in that. And that kind of funded uh, the Formula Ford stuff. And then my dad helped me obviously come over to the U.S. and do the USF 2000 stuff uh, the first year. But not he couldn't do the whole budget because it was still very expensive. Right. And then that was it. Like that's all my dad could help with financially. So anything above or anything that I've done outside of that first year in USF 2000 has just been all on my own trying to find the funding and the sponsorship and lights it was cheaper back then than it is now but it's still super expensive and yeah i, I was just that was out for me in terms of trying to come mil. back i think it was a half mil back then right yeah it was i like mean i think it's 800 one, 900 last i heard it was 1.3 or something now, yeah it's, it might be it's around 1.3 when the new cars and everything came out those new costs for everything and so it's around a mil in lights right now and so yeah i just <laughs> I think I was, yeah, that was, that was me to the, that was toast for me. But luckily at that time period, I was, um, I actually met Crusher and the guys in Australia and Pertec and all those guys. And they, um, were putting together the, the Indy 500 deal. So I was lucky enough to come out of that, do some Formula E races, do some IndyCar testing with Andretti and then, uh, got the Indy 500 ride out of that. So it was still pretty successful. And even though I had no money, I mean, it was, my career was still going pretty good at that point. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, whenever you hear him say I was three years in slicks and wings in 2014, I think it was, and then a couple of years later, where's he at? The Indy 500. So yeah. he never thought about slowing down. But when those opportunities present, man, you absolutely you know, have to go for that deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of been my, the story of my whole career is um, an opportunity has come up and I've taken it and people are gone like, you know, where, why, like, why, why are you doing that? You have no testing or whatever, but that's, if you're in a situation where you're, you're not bankrolled by funding, Absolutely. you don't have a choice. Right. So when I did the, the road to India, I did the three years and that was it. Like that's, I didn't have another, I didn't have a, an option to do more. That was, that was the only option I had. And then the options and the opportunities came up with the IndyCar stuff. I wasn't going to say no, regardless of the testing and everything. And then, you know, everything else I've done has been the same way. So I, I just, that was, I was shoehorned into that. You know, if, if you're going to do it, you got to do it. And if you're, you know, if you have the luxury of testing and as much seat time as you like, I mean, it definitely helps, but some, some people don't have that option, unfortunately. So in 97, you talked about your father and his brother winning at Bathurst fast forward 21 years and you grab a win. Yeah. At Bathurst. It, was, it was awesome. I mean, I, um, that was just another thing that came up. I was in Australia um, running the super truck stuff. And uh, I knew some of the V8 supercar guys having just grown up over there. And I guess the the way the regulations work is you have to run a car. Otherwise, you get fined because it's like a franchise thing like that NASCAR does. And 
a driver didn't show up to one of the races and i had never driven or like been in a supercar in my entire life Those things are so awesome and the guy rang me up the team owner and was like i have to run this car this weekend and you're here with the super trucks right and i'd flown in th- through dubai from the u.s to be in perth because it was on the other side of australia and he's i was like yeah sure like i'll do it i'll jump in no practice never driven a supercar like fine i'll do what it what could go wrong yeah what could go wrong <laughs> So I'd never driven a car like that and I just jumped in and I, I did pretty well. I, I qualified my teammate in the first, like the first time I ever drove the car. So it was pretty successful. I mean, the team and I were, I was brand new, so I was struggling and the team was, uh, was struggling too. They were uh, running like a pretty low budget team, but yeah, we got through the race, no problems. And I had a, a good time and that springboarded me into doing the Bathurst 12 hour in a sports car. So I did it with BMW and Tony Longhurst um, gave me a really good deal and it was myself Aaron Seaton and Tony and Tony put together just an awesome team an awesome car and it was just one of those another thing it was it was a dream for us like it was it was one of those weekends where it was super easy all we had to do was bring the car home and we knew we had the pace and um, we won the GT4 class at, at the at the Bathurst 12 hours that was awesome and it, winning any race at Bathurst is mega Great stuff, for sure. Once again, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Matty Brabs, one of the most successful names in all of motorsports. This segment of The Skinny has been brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain for extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match. Look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need. The trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. We're back here on the skinny. A little rainy outside here in Speedway today. Some testing that went on out there last week and a lot of racing that was at the Speedway, by the way, uh, last weekend. But the eight-hour coming up this weekend. So SRO will be out there turning some laps with some of the best. And uh, we'll have a couple of drivers on here uh, with the skinny coming up very, very soon as well, including one of the Data Act guys from TRD. Looking forward to getting Shaggy in here. So some great shows coming your way very soon. Ken Stout, Michael Young sitting alongside. Matty Brabs, one of the young guns here, very, very talented, trying to scrap his way into this industry, has had a lot of success, has seen the highest level, and a start with Indianapolis 500, has won a number of races, a two-time, and I venture to say three-time, Stadium Super Truck Champ, because uh, you've got a sizable points lead over there, and we'll see if we come up another weekend or not. But if not, you've already locked that thing up for the third time. By the way, the only three-time champion in the history of the series. Nobody else has more than two. So uh, if and when that becomes official, congratulations on that. And uh, if, if memory serves, and it did happen... Rumor has it you had a pretty good day today. You were uh, you were doing some things that will line you up for next year. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you what I might do. I guess I haven't announced anything yet, but I had I I've done two seat fittings this week, so it's like I have nothing going on for years, and then all of a sudden there's stuff going on. So I mean, it's exciting, but yeah, I haven't announced anything yet. So we'll keep the news out. But yeah, so I why be. would you have two seat settings? Well, uh, one of them just fittings, I'm just helping a, a team out with some setups and, and development, which is something okay. I've always done. Um, so that's not really too new. But the other thing is is uh, I should be back full time, hopefully next year doing something. So 
can't say what that something is just yet. Nothing's been announced, but it's all more positive and and more exciting than I have had in the recent years. Because <laughs> usually it's one of those deals where you go, oh, is it going to happen? I'm, I'm not sure, but no, this this seems pretty um pretty good. So and that's got to be the frustrating part. You you've done so many great things and you've had so many opportunities, but to me. It's never been the great opportunity. It's been an opportunity that if you don't take it, you're not going to get an opportunity. That hopefully, this next one will be a great opportunity. Yeah, that's that's the plan, and that's I think I'm smarter and older now to understand that. I mean, I think when I was younger, I was like, I just got to win. I just got to win. That's all I'm focused on, and I wasn't great on the business side of things. So I've learned over the years. I've learned and seen a lot of people come through in the way they've done it, and uh, I think I can give it another shot and and build up some momentum and get back to where what I want to do and what where I want to be which is my goal has always been IndyCar so I, I'm really pushing for that and that's what I've been working on and I just haven't had any traction in the last couple of years so hopefully it all starts coming together and I can be smarter smarter about it and um and get as many people and friends and connections and and just get the whole thing going again because at the moment I'm just I'm I'm still doing the super trucks. I've I've been successful. I mean, my my name has been on the radar a lot in the IndyCar stuff, but I'm just not there. So I just need to get back in and start getting my name out of there again. Everybody knows who you are in IndyCar. I mean, yeah. it's 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 an important step, but it can also be a very frustrating step. Not only do they know who you are, but they know you're capable, very capable of of winning, being fast in an IndyCar, not necessarily an Indy Lights car, even to the point that you drive the two seater at a number of events. Uh, across the the country throughout the entire tour. So if they have that much faith in you to put a, a fan in the back of the <laughs> car with you and let you go rip, and you guys do rip. I mean, I we've had plenty of discussions with Davey Hamilton, and and certainly Mario Andretti still believes it's a race. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a riot with those guys. I mean, Mario. I, I mean, that's what he does for fun at the moment, and he's trimming the car out at, at Indy, and he's doing all kinds of setup stuff and. We're all there, like looking at, like, is this? Are we here racing, or are we taking passes around? Like, and there's Mario taking front wing out, you know, on the radio. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a blast to be a part of all that. But yeah, no, I, I know all those guys really well, and I mean, it's, but it just come at the end of the day, it comes down to the, the funding has to come from somewhere. So whether it's you being a good enough driver that a sponsor wants to have you in the car, or you having family connections that have lots of lots of money like it's dad or mom or an uncle and uh i just don't have that luxury i mean obviously a lot of people look at me and say oh well you're a brab i'm like surely there's something there for you um and that's just not the case like i my parents were like if you're going to do this it's going to be it's going to be difficult and you're going to have to find it on your own and and you're you're on your own like we'll help with everything else but my dad was never a good businessman. He was a he was a racing driver. Your your big run at the Indianapolis 500 in 2016. It was the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500. So all eyes are on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You get a ride. You qualify. Take us back to the first time you got up to speed. You got through the rookie orientation, but now you're at speed. Don't even walk us through qualifying, although that might be a fun story. What was it like going around that place at speed? Oh, it's just it's just incredible. I mean, it's it's just something you could never, even though you can give someone a really good experience in the two seater Indy car around in the IMS, you can never describe or give that feeling what it's really like to race and and to be a part of it and drive at that speed. You know, in, in the two seater we do like 180, and uh, you know, which is pretty good 180 190 <laughs> legit. but it, it's not it's still not the same like it's when you go in 230 and you're trimming the car out and it's skating and it's going through the corners and you've got someone right next to you or you're trying to make a pass i mean the there's just so much that you don't know you, do, you don't see or you don't feel you don't know unless you're actually driving the car and it's like a chess game i mean i was just talking to someone today about the race and they're asking me, oh, you know, what is it like? And what's the race like? Is it? And I'm like, it's just, it's like a chess game. Like it's just so much strategy that comes out of just the 500 and that track alone that's different to every other race in the world. You know, you could race everything and still go to that track and be, oh, like this is completely different. But it's just a, just an amazing experience. I was so happy to be a part of it. And it was the 100th running, so it was full. And it, the atmosphere was incredible. Does, yeah. it, does the speed ever become normal does it ever normalize it yeah two th so 230 then turns into now i can maneuver everything slows down so when you come into the pit stop 
it's got to be insanely like what's going on yeah. now I'm doing 55. Yeah, I think that's why you see so many people losing it coming into the pits or making mistakes in the pit lane because you know there's a lot of pit stops in the 500 and your brain just slows down and becomes accustomed to that speed. Like certainly when I first got in and I turned in, I, I turned in way too late. I'm like, holy, like this is, it happens so fast that speed. Like anything that happens at 230 miles an hour is exaggerated to what happens at 100 miles an hour or whatever. So you just get naturally used to it though it's kind of like a weird feeling like the first bunch of laps you're just like your eyes are like huge you're like whole you're like wow like this is this is scaring me a little bit you know and i can't keep up mentally but then you adjust and then certainly there yeah when you come back in the pitch you feel like you're walking down the pit lane <laughs> like so i think that's why so many people make mistakes but you're it's like a weird natural thing in your head like your brain just adjusts over time i think it's like an adaption thing i, I don't know but Certainly, the first time you drive out there, it's it's a little eye opening for sure, and then you get used to it. So, it's it's it has to be very daunting, and and the levels are even the first step, the the rookie orientation. You get through with that, and you got to be walking out of there with a big smile on your face. But then, like you said, you get back in the car and think to yourself, okay, now I've got to go practice with all these other guys. Like I'm just as scared again as I was when I got in it the first time. And I I look at people like Scott Dixon, for example, and and having the pleasure of being on the radio with him and listening to how the things that he says, he's not just driving his car. He's driving his car. He knows what this guy in front of him is yeah. going to do. He's planning what these guys are doing. He's come on the radio and said, what's the rest of the field look like? Do I, I, I might want to stretch it out a little bit, or I might want to back it up a little bit. And, and he's very wary of, or very concerned, I should say, of causing a crash. So like if the pace is too slow from the leaders and it jams everybody up, he's afraid it's going to cause a crash too. So, and he doesn't want that to happen. So um, it's pretty cool that you say, you know, at first my brain had to catch up. And then once it catches up, the next things you start processing while you're out there, including all the, all the cars around you. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that you don't even realize. So like, you know, there's, and there's veteran things too. So I used to see the guys in practice, they would come off the back straight and they go all the way down below the white line, nearly in the grass and come back up. And I'm like, what the hell are they doing? And that's like the universal term for like, I'm pitting this lap mm -hmm. in practice. So you don't try and like stick a nose on them as they're coming down to pit lane. They do it in the race too. But that's something like I saw Dixon doing. And I'm like, like I asked him like, what are you, why are you doing that? Like, and it's like, oh, that's like the universal sign that you're going to pit. You're like, okay, so then you start figuring out all these little things that those guys have just been doing for years. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't know at practice yeah. because when they do that, the guys that are behind them will tuck down behind them for a minute to catch draft and then pop back out. And go. They know what they're going to do, but if you're young and you're a rookie, yeah, you're, you're like, I, I didn't know what they were doing. You just have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so much strategy. So like, if you, if you want to try and pass, you really have to start lifting. If you want to pass someone down the front straight, you generally have to start lifting and lining them up on the the following straight the, the straight before on the back straight and that's like what happens with the race is the leaders start trying to slow it down so they're lifting before going into the corner so then they're bunching the field up in certain parts of the track and then these guys are trying to like unbunch the field and get a run so there's like a whole like accordion effect and there's a whole strategy to how you manage the accordion effect and if you're the leader you can manage it to stop yourself from being passed so if you start lifting right as you enter the corner the guy can't pass you, but then he gets too close or he gets the arrow wash and then he can't pass you down the back straight because he's lost his momentum. And those guys like Dixon and everyone that's been around like that, you know, like I was blown away that Cash and Evers won it this year, but they're the types of people that go into a race like that and they know how to play the game, right? Whereas the young guys, it's so hard to, to know how to play the game. I think like R Rossi was the last rookie yeah. and he won on fuel strategy. So he, it's not like he was playing, you know, the game, but there's a whole game to it and it's the race is so fun because of all those things. And I, I don't think it's just the cars, the combination of the track. Like, I don't think NASCAR has that same kind of effect, but they kind of have that more effect at Daytona, but there's just a strategy and a, uh, the race is just so different. So fun because of that. The race craft is tricky out there for sure. Yeah. Hey man, we, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come by here. You live here in the area I know, and uh, we want to get your father in here as well. And, uh, I'd love to have you come back with your father, actually. It'd be great to have both of you here on, on the show. Time. But 
Uh, we appreciate you taking the time and wish you the best of luck. Keep us up to date on what's happening. We'll, the second you can release that information, we want to push it out here as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, You cheers. deserve it. You certainly <laughs> deserve it. Yeah, we wish you the best, man. So keep your eyes on Matty Brabs. Hopefully uh, he becomes a household name, somebody that you're very familiar with. He certainly possesses the talent to get there. He just needs that opportunity. So now you know the skinny on the beginning of Matty Brabs' career, and hopefully it develops into something that we all know about across the waves. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios, all rights reserved.